Hello, and welcome to part three of my four-part series where I will be talking about Treasure Planet. And just so you know, there are spoilers ahead. This one is a pretty popular underrated movie, and it's gaining more and more popularity over the years as people are discovering it, because it's amazing. It's taking the story of Treasure Island and retelling it in space. It's space pirates. The directors for this movie, Ron Clements and John Musker, have worked on a couple other projects that you've probably heard of, such as Aladdin, Hercules, and Moana. But Treasure Planet was a movie that they wanted to make for years, but could never get greenlit. And through a series of events that I won't dive into right now, they finally were able to get their wish and make this movie that they wanted to make so badly. So let's start off by talking about the visuals. This movie, probably more than almost any other 2D animated movie, implements the use of 3D animation. They used something that was actually made and used at first for Tarzan, which is a program called Deep Canvas, in which you create 3D objects, but then paint them 2D, and then have your 2D characters interact with them. It was a way to make the movie much more dynamic than it would have been able to be otherwise just sliding right and left on a 2D plane. And in Treasure Planet, the entire ship that they're on for the majority of the movie is completely using this deep canvas technique. With that technology, they were able to tell a story so much better than they would have been able to otherwise. Like the spaceport is a good example. The, that looks like the crescent moon, which I love the intro to that, by the way, how you're starting out in Delbert's study and then it starts zooming up on it and you just think it's a moon. But then as it starts getting closer and closer, you realize that's no moon. It's a wonderful reveal and it takes advantage of the 3D technology so well to make such an epic shot and reveal. Even though this is an instance where the 3D does kind of separate from the 2D and doesn't complement each other. I, I think the 3D every once in a while, and especially in this scene, does kind of stick out and is a little bit distracting. But it's not through the whole movie and it helps tell their story better. And so I don't mind, you get over it pretty quick. It's no big deal. And the character designs are just so fun. If you're going to have a story take place in space with aliens and it's 2D, you might as well go the whole nine yards. And they, the characters' designs that they came up with are so bizarre and creative and out there. And I'm grateful that they took advantage of that, that they realized they weren't tied down to prosthetics or something like that and they had to make them all human-esque. No, they're all completely different and completely creative. It really helps enrich this world that they have built. And speaking of this world that they have built, let's talk about some world building. So these, these creators, what they wanted to do was blend the pirate-esque era with a futuristic world. Like using ships, instead of it being spaceships or whatever, it is sea ships, but they use the sails as solar panels? How clever is that? How that is the fuel, that is the means by which it is able to travel, but they were able to keep the same design as an old-timey ship, but adapt it and alter it to fit into this futuristic world. And there are examples like that through the whole movie of how they were able to combine and marry these two worlds together to make it just so interesting and epic and it keeps your interest the whole time and you're constantly being surprised and impressed through the whole movie. And this world that this story is set is obviously an alternate universe to ours because they're doing things that aren't possible in our world, like the ships being open. Like you could think, oh, maybe there's some sort of force field or something they're living in, but they show people and creatures outside of the ship's boundaries quite a bit. So you're like, okay, this is a world in which physics and science is not exactly like ours. And so with that in mind, they're able to do whatever they want because they're not tied down to our rules of reality, which makes it even more fun. So let's start talking about characters. And I'm actually gonna start with the side characters on this one. Captain Amelia is such an ex excellent character. Her character design is great. Her, the role she plays in the movie is fantastic. And the voice for her is done by Emma Thompson, which is just perfect. She has such an authority vibe in her voice, but it's also warm and funny. And the script that they gave her is awesome as well. Mr. Arrow, I've checked this miserable ship from stem to stern, and as usual, it's spot on. Doctor, it's a mule and blabber about a treasure map 
in front of this particular crew demonstrates a level of ineptitude that borders on the imbecilic, and I mean that in a very caring way. This movie also gave us the gift that is the side character of Delbert. We can help her! Dang it, Jim, I'm an astronomer, not a doctor. I mean, I am a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. I have a doctorate. It's not the same thing. You can't help people with a doctorate. You just sit there and you're useless. For me, his character is one of the highlights of this movie. And David Hyde Pierce, who is the voice of Delbert, is such a talented voice actor. I absolutely love this character. He's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Now let's talk about Jim and Silver. Like I said before, it doesn't matter how amazing your movie looks. If your characters in your story aren't strong, it doesn't matter. And they spent a great deal of thought and time and energy to make sure that these characters worked. And I appreciate it so much because it carries the movie and just enhances it and makes it that much better. For instance, like how they made Silver a father figure for Jim. That gave them a pretty strong bond. When Jim is little, we see that his father left. And normally, I don't like it when movies depict fathers in such a negative way. But in this movie, it really works. Because Jim has that void in his life, he's wanting and missing a father figure. When Silver steps in and takes him on and starts teaching him things and coaching him and giving him emotional support, it really enhances that relationship and gives them an even stronger and tighter bond than it would have otherwise. No, you listen to me, James Hawkins. You got the makings of greatness in you, but you gotta take the helm and charge your own course. Stick to it, no matter the squalls. And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there, catching some of the light coming off you that day. And because they did that, it makes the, when they turn on each other and that betrayal so much more dramatic. And when they come back together at the end, it makes that so much more emotional because their relationship has been established to be so strong. And it's implemented in shots like this that are just so masterful in telling stories like that in such a short amount of time. And the woods are just whispers and lies that I'll never believe And I want a moment to be real Wanna touch things I don't feel And you really do buy this relationship. They take their time and they, the script is so skillfully written that you are able to appreciate these characters together and apart. With the character of Jim, they did a really good job of making him a proactive character where instead of it being Billy Bones just shows up at the inn and you know as a guest there and whatever for a while before the pirates attack, he crash landed outside of their inn and Jim brought him in and so Jim feels kind of responsible and has some guilt for the damage that he caused to his mom's inn. And then his decision to go and seek out Treasure Planet to try and right his wrongs, become a better person, and have an adventure. All very proactive, and it really makes us root for him to be because he's trying to do these things. Oh, and speaking of Jim, I want to take time to just highlight one of the best transitions in movie history, which is when he's a little kid, under the sheets, reading a book about spacers, adventurers, and how who he wants to be and where he wants to end up in life. The transition to him being older and the animation is so smooth oh it's masterful and I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that because that's worth pointing out but you can tell that the entire movie is given that kind of thought and attention to detail so that not a moment is wasted every character is relevant has their time to shine has their effect on other characters it's a masterfully written script beautifully executed voice art the art and design is just breathtaking. This movie is worth watching. If you haven't seen this movie, I definitely recommend going and watching it. So thank you for watching part three of my four part series. 
and I hope you will join me over in part four where I'm going to be talking about some concepts that relate to all three of these movies. I'll be talking about 2D animation, the integration of 3D animation, what happened to it and where it might go, and some other miscellaneous things that kind of are on that subject. I will add a link to that video somewhere on the screen here and also in the description down below. Hope to see you there.